In this video, I would like to start talking about how to approach decisions when the potential harm is great. Let's jump right in with a simple gambling example. Suppose you are playing a game and you have a 50% chance of winning $1 million and a 50% chance of losing $500,000. The expected value here would be 0.5 times 1 million minus 0.5 times $500,000 which equals to $250,000. This game has a huge positive expected value. Now, suppose you are someone whose entire net worth is equal to $500,000. Would you risk playing this game? Despite the large expected value, this game is very dangerous and you should not play it because there is a 50% chance of losing everything you have, which of course is a very devastating loss. Therefore, this game would go into the high impact category and must be treated differently than the low impact ones we have dealt with so far. In these cases, looking at the expected value is not enough. We also need to look at the potential harm or loss. If it is significant and could have a huge negative impact on your life, it is not wise to take the risk. When we say potential harm, we are talking about an outcome that has a fair chance of occurring. When you think about it, every decision or event in life could end tragically. Every day when I leave my house, I could potentially get in an accident and be killed. But we take this risk every day because the chances of this happening are low enough that we do not let it stop us. Let's look at an example that is a bit more plausible. Suppose you are looking at a real estate project that will cost $2 million in investments. In order to do this, you would put down $500,000 of your own money and borrow $1.5 million from the bank. Suppose that when you are done with the property, it will have a 50% chance of selling for $3 million or more. But as with any project, there is some chance, say 50%, that something will go wrong and your property gives you only, say, $1.5 million. Let's look at what's going on here. You are borrowing $1.5 million from the bank and for simplicity's sake, let's say the interest rate is 0%. If the property sells for $3 million, you have to give the bank $1.5 million, which means that you are also left with $1.5 million for yourself, which means your profit is $1 million. In the second case, you sell the property for $1.5 million, all of which goes to the bank. Then you have lost $500,000 of your own money on this project. You'll notice that these numbers are the exact same as the gambling problem I began this video with. Thus, the expected value of this project would then be $250,000. This is where the concept of leverage comes into play, which happens when you are working with other people's money. Leverage is a double-edged sword. If you are successful in your project, you triple your money. However, due to the multiplying nature of leverage, your losses are also great if you are unsuccessful. Leverage magnifies your profit, but it also magnifies your losses. Now, I would like to talk about another important issue here. Consider two people, A and B. Person A is rich and is worth $5 million in assets. Person B is in good shape financially, but has only $500,000. Think about these two people in relation to the previous example. For person A, the worst case scenario would be that he loses his $500,000. If that happens, he will still have $4.5 million, experiencing only a 10% loss. This is not devastating. On the other hand, person B could potentially lose everything and therefore could not take advantage of the risk of this project. This is one of the reasons why the rich continue to get richer while the middle class do not advance as quickly. The rich people are able to take bigger risks than the average person, so their payout is greater. Now, let's do a quick recap of the past few videos. So far, we have learned that for low harm decisions, the expected value or utility principles and satisfying are good tools. We also discussed the sunk cost fallacy, which can apply to decisions of any magnitude. When it comes solely to high impact decisions though, we have to consider the potential harm. If it is too great or not acceptable, you have to avoid or remove that risk before moving forward. You can still use the expected utility principle in high-stakes decisions, 
but you should use it in conjunction with a serious consideration of the worst case scenario and its likelihood. This is a good foundation, but we need to dig a little deeper when it comes to working with events rather than conscious decisions. In the next few videos, we will discuss how to better manage such scenarios. Thank you for watching.